Well, good evening, everyone. 15 seconds, but we'll start a little bit early. Well, actually, by the time I stop talking about this, it'll be right on time. So uh, welcome back, everyone. Has, you, ha, has your summer just like flown by? Because like, it, it partly seems like forever ago that we were together, but also it seems like just a little bit ago. That's true. Doesn't that smoke just make it so depressing? Ah. Yeah. Well, let's open up in a word of prayer. Uh, hopefully you grab notes on the back. Uh, you can slide those into your theology notebook, but you'll probably need a new, bigger binder if you're going to do all of them in one volume. But we can talk about that in a bit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for who you are and what you have done for us. We thank you that for whatever reason, well, truly your reason, you have seen fit to make man notable in this creation. You have seen fit to lay, set your love and affection upon us. You have seen fit to care for us with your great kindness. We thank you, Lord, for that goodness and that grace. Help us to understand these things as much as possible and to encourage one another as the days draw near. We love you, Lord. Amen. All righty. Uh, I do have one copy of last year's notes for theology printing off, and we can make a copy if anyone would like the entire set from last year. Uh, there's also lectures online. Uh, Tim, you're the only one who's really new, and Paul, you, you came a few times last year, right? Yeah. So if anyone wants the full set, let me know, and we can, I can have my people make a copy for you, namely Derek and Krista. Uh, but if not, great. Uh, anyways, uh, so in your notes, first off, I want to remind you, I printed off something that I put in our notes from last year, uh, and it's that page, How Should We Handle Differences in Doctrine? And I just wanted to start us off with this topic, have this fresh in our mind, because we're going to have differences of opinion, right? We are all human, and yes, this word is the perfect word of God, but the interpretation of it sometimes differs. And we're talking about theology, so sometimes our conclusions in doctrine will be different. And that's generally okay as long as we follow these guidelines. So Al Mohler, in 2005, wrote an article about theological triage, he called it, separating out uh, differences in doctrines. What's truly important? What's mm, somewhat important? And what's kind of not important? Well, not not important, but we can differ tertiary. Ooh, we've got some good students right here. They even remembered that obscure word. Oh, okay. Well, then I would like to, in all gentleness, say, cheater. Uh, no, so I think this is very helpful and something that we have to keep in mind. Uh, I printed it all off. You can read it in your own time, but as a summary, the primary doctrines are the doctrines by which the church stands or falls. Doctrines such as Christ crucified. The gospel is a primary doctrine. Everything in the gospel is a primary doctrine. Uh, the fact that God is a trinity, he's triune, he's Father, Son, and Spirit, that's a primary doctrine. If you believe that God is only one single unified God like Allah, you are coming, you are disagreeing on a primary doctrine with what this church holds. Uh, so primary doctrines are the doctrines that separate Christians from non-Christians. They are really important. Uh, justification by faith alone, apart from works, is another primary doctrine. That we are saved by believing in Christ's completed work on our behalf and not in what we do for God or on behalf of God. Christ alone saves us. If you want to add works in there, then we're talking about a different gospel and a different primary doctrine. Secondary doctrines are ones that we can have disagreements on, but they're significant enough that maybe you should go to a different church if you hold to a different doctrine. And I'm not saying categorically go to a different church if you hold a different secondary doctrine, but it may just be helpful. Uh, if you have a certain view of spiritual gifts, if you have a certain view of infant baptism or believer's baptism, if you have a certain view on, I don't know, give me some other ones, guys. I'm coming up short for whatever reason. Uh, eschatology. Well, uh, 
I'm going to put eschatology in tertiary, although, uh, huh? Yeah, we shouldn't divide over end times, but juice versus wine, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Hughes versus, well, these, so these are all third level doctrines, ones that we can disagree with on and be perfectly content together. Casting out demons, that could be a secondary kind of third level. It's kind of, there's a gray area. It depends on how, how much you view it, how important it is. If it's just kind of something that you believe in, it, and I believe that there is demonic possession and things like that. So I'm just talking about distinctions and levels. Christians can't have demons. That's actually almost a primary one, right? Because if a Christian could have a demon, then the, then the power of the gospel almost is incomplete. But, but yeah, we'll put it in secondary. Thank you. It's the first secondary one that you... Come on, guys. She's new. She's brand new, and she's showing you up. We spent all this time last year together. No, I'm just kidding. Yes. And by the way, in case you couldn't tell, I am incredibly sarcastic and incredibly have a delightful wit. So, uh, well, you can be a judge of that. That's tertiary. <laughs> tertiary. Uh, third level doctrines are ones that if we disagree on, we can still have fellowship over. We can still minister in the same church over. Uh, infant baptism is one of those classic ones. Uh, should we baptize infants or believing adults uh, or believing children? Um, that's definitely a secondary issue. Spiritual gifts, and again, depending on how stringently you hold these, if you're like one, if you're like my brother-in-law, for example, my brother-in-law could not come to this church. And I'm sorry, Ian, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. You're welcome here, but you wouldn't fit in well. I'm sorry. That's just how it is. And one day in heaven, we will worship around the throne in perfect harmony and unity, and we will do so in joy. Uh, but my brother-in-law, Ian, is a Assemblies of God pastor in Ely, Nevada. He puts a huge emphasis on speaking in tongues, huge emphasis on prophecy, huge emphasis on charismatic gifts and worship. That doesn't fit in well in our church. You can hold those views, but if you agree to disagree with us and just kind of put it on the back burner, you're welcome here. We're not going to push you out unless you actually become divisive on it. And if you actually become divisive, then it almost bumps up to a primary doctrinal level because you're being a divisive person over secondary or even tertiary doctrine. Uh, does that all make sense to the questions? Tim? Women preaching. That's another great one. Yes. Ordaining women in ministry. We don't do that at this church. And that we believe that's what the Bible says. Other churches believe the opposite. And other churches have their convictions and they have sound biblical, well, they have their biblical interpretation. I don't believe it's sound personally, not that I'm a chauvinist. I just believe that God created different roles and uh, 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 different roles and responsibilities within the family of God. Yeah. Great ones. Golly, guys, the new people are just knocking it out of the park this evening. Uh, whether you can lose your salvation or not. Great one. Yeah. And that gets along. Secondary. I, would, I believe that's firmly a secondary because guys like John Wesley, I think John Wesley held to something like that. And would I, I, I kind of think, and this is a little bit sentimental, but would I put John Wesley in hell? No. No, I wouldn't. And that's the difference between primary doctrine. Are, is this the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? Or is this just the difference between one church and another church? Yes. Yeah. And so my brother-in-law, I don't doubt his salvation because he holds the spiritual gift. I don't doubt his salvation because his wife is co-pastor with him. Uh, we just have different perspectives on Scripture, and they have different perspectives on Scripture. And one day, he's saying at our wedding, right, when we all get to heaven, which offended some people, uh, when we get to heaven we'll have these secondary and third level issues and differences resolved because we're all agreeing on the primary to begin with if we made it to heaven. <laughs> the main thing is the main thing, and the main thing is Jesus. Exactly. 
great, great one. What do you guys think? Jesus has a brother, namely Satan. Primary, secondary, or thirdy, third level? Primary. Mormons also believe in salvation by works. That's why they're all Eagle Scouts or whatever um, trail life they've got now. Uh, that's why they're all really good people and really good friends. I, I like Mormons a lot, but I do not believe that they hold to the same God because of work salvation. Other questions on these? So this is important because as we go through the weeks and months, not years, just months, this one I'm going to be quicker about. Uh, well, I guess it'll span two years, but no, it won't span two years. It'll go into two years. Uh, but over the course of this time, I'll be talking about what's primary, what's secondary, and what's third level. And when you hear third level, this is just kind of my opinion, and if you like it, great. If not, that's fine. If it's secondary level and you disagree with me, let's have a discussion about it. And if it's primary and we, you disagree, we need to have a discussion. Uh, and that's one of the things, just taking the Trinity for, as a, for an example, right? That the Father, Son, and Spirit are all three one person and yet three persons and yet one God. Difficult to comprehend, difficult to understand, but it's necessary that we at least accept that on faith. If you believe that there are three individual gods, three gods, we have a problem. If you believe that there's one God and he just shows himself as father, shows himself as son, shows himself as spirit sometimes, we have a problem. Uh, and sometimes new believers don't understand those because it's difficult and not necessarily a part of the gospel. Usually it's repent and believe, and, and they believe, and then this gets added along the way. Does that make sense? So sometimes these primary doctrines you can hold to a different view, but once you're confronted with it, the true child of God will believe the truth of the primary doctrine. Okay. Other questions? Virgin birth. I believe is a primary doctrine. Because if Christ was not born of a virgin, then he was born in the line of the first. He was born in the same likeness of the first Adam, and he couldn't have been the second and better Adam for us. Which we're going to talk about this module. Uh, so getting into the topic of our discussion, if you look at the cover page, uh, this is part three, and that's just because I'm OCD. Not obsessive Calvinist disorder, although I am a Calvinist, uh, but... OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, there should be a part two. And Lord willing, I may do part two. And you might actually get a complete set of notes. Uh, although there is a part four, which I don't think that I'm ever going to teach because it's on the end times and I just don't have the guts in order to take on all of that research and wade through all of the different opinions. But parts one, two, and three are vitally important. And in this section, we're looking at anthropology, that's probably the one section in theology that most of you understand what it is, right? Anyone know what anthropology is? Study of man. It's a college discipline. Uh, hamartiology, guesses. Just take a guess. Sin. Hey, good job. Hamartia, exactly. And then soteriology. Salvation. So we're looking at the doctrines of man, sin, and salvation. Really, really light and easy stuff to cover. Um, <laughs> uh, I will be upfront with you. I definitely have a historic pos confessional position on most of these things. Uh, if you flip to the next page, it's the cover to anthropology. And I did something new because I've recently become convinced and confessional in my doctrine. What does confessional mean? It means that I generally subscribe to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. Uh, generally speaking, I think that that is an accurate summary of the Christian faith uh, and what us Baptists believe. Uh, if you want, there is a modernized version at founders.org, I believe it is. If you just type in Founders 1689... It'll come up with their website with a modernized version of the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. As you can guess, 1689, it was written almost 400 years ago. So the language is a little bit challenging, but it's still readable. Uh, and what I've done is I copied that now instead of just poignant quotes that I found because it was easier and, and good. 
So my perspective, the theology that I'm going to be teaching you guys is largely reflective of the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is largely reflective of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is largely reflected of the Bible. Uh, so I believe that that's the historic tradition, or that is the historic tradition that I fall into. I just want to connect you guys to history, right? So often in our modern culture, we think that we have it all right, or we've found something new. No, when it comes to Christianity, the old stuff is the good stuff, just in general. Except for Arius, he's an old guy, but he's a heretic, and that's not a good old one. But mostly, old stuff is good stuff. At least if we still know about it now, it stood the test of time. Yes. So anthropology, what is a human? The Bible holds mankind as a unique and special creation of God. Men and women are the only creatures who are said to bear the image of God. This means mankind fundamental, is fundamentally distinct and different from the animals. In the modern world especially, the doctrine of man has become vitally important as it, sees, it seems assaults on the image of God are coming from every side. Within this section, we'll be looking at the def, biblical definition of what a man or woman is and how that impacts our ethics, especially in this fallen and corrupt world. Uh, the doctrine of anthropology is one of the most critical doctrines for our ethics. What's ethics? Huh? One more time. Moral codes. How we should live. Making choices. Thinking as a Christian. Living as a Christian. What is right? What is wrong? The doctrine of anthropology, as we're going to see, has huge impact. What's one of the most obvious impact of the doctrine of anthropology in the image of God? Maybe. Okay. Gender is a big one. And think political. Politics is radically assaulting the image of God. Abortion. If man is created in the image of God then abortion is destruction of the image of God. Euthanasia. War. Just war theory, or lack thereof. Uh, gender and sexuality. Uh, even fertility treatments. We'll talk about that later on when we get to it. I haven't written that section up. It's going to take a long time, and I'm looking forward, Ben, that you're preaching next week, and I get to write those notes up. The Lord is kind that way, isn't he? Families, definitely. Huh? Medicine, yeah. Medical research, definitely. Even autonomy, yeah. Do you have something to add to it? Oh, okay. I, use, I wear contacts, and when I wear glasses, I have the same thing. Oh, yeah. Didn't you hear that news story? I forget the exact news story, but that rings a bell of a news story that I read about a little while back that someone spliced animal gene genetics with human genetics. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I won't promise that you're going to fix any of these problems, but you'll at least understand the Christian perspective on these issues uh, in hopefully a clear, I hope, way. But here's what the 1689 says, chapter 4, paragraphs 2 and 3. After God made all the other creatures, he created humanity. He made them male and female with rational and immortal souls, thereby making them suited to that life lived unto God for which they were created. Westminster Confession, or Catechism, first question, what is the chief end of man? To know and to love God, right? Yeah, that's probably the only Westminster Confession response that I actually know. But to know and love God, right? So going back to our confession, I'm sorry, that just popped in my head and that's how I work sometimes. They were made in the image of God, being endowed with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. They had the law of God written in their hearts and the power to fulfill it. Even so, they could still transgress the law because they were left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject to change. Paragraph 3, in addition to the law written in their hearts, they received a command 
not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As long as they obeyed this command, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creature. There's kind of a summary of why God created man and for what purpose. So the first section in our anthropology is the origin of man. It's always good to start with an origin story, right? It's good and right to start at the beginning to answer the question, what is man? Oh, by the way, a note to our new Hummers, feel free to interrupt me. If, even if I'm in the middle of reading, just say, uh, excuse me, Jeff, and if you've got a question on something that I just said. Derek? Oh, thank you. Of course, I bring these, so why not talk about them? Uh, if you are interested in further reference, I just I forgot about this, and so I grabbed the first two that I found, but these are the best two. Uh, well, this one is absolutely the easiest and best place to start. If you're interested in learning more about systematic theology, this is a great introduction to biblical doctrine. That's the title. This is Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology uh, in a brand new edition that some nice pastor gave me some time. Uh, if you're interested in more, this is where I would start. Wayne Grudem, he's easy to understand as far as theologians go, which he is actually easy to understand, uh, and I like him a lot. I disagree with him on several areas, but they're all, guess what? Secondary issues, not primary issues. Oh. Well, there you go. It's even in audiobook format. Uh, the other one that I grabbed, I haven't interacted with it too much, but it's John MacArthur and Dick Mayhew's Systematic Theology. Uh, as you can see, it's equally weighty. This one would probably be more difficult to read than this one. So if you're getting one, get this. And next week I'll bring in Joel Beakey. He's fantastic. Uh, he's in the process of writing a four-volume set, and I've got the first two. So I'll bring those next week. I'm really big on bringing books. Also, I don't know why I grabbed this, but hey, you, you brought up books. So this is your fault, Derek. If there are any fathers in this room... This is a phenomenal book that has spoken to my soul more than any father parenting book I have read in a long time. It's called Being Dad, Father as a Picture of God's Grace. Uh, fathers, grandfathers, get this book, read this book. It's, a, it's actually a slow book. It takes me a long time to read this book, uh, which probably would dissuade you if you knew me. Uh, no, it's not that small print. It's just meaty. It, it's stuff that you think about. Uh, Scott Keith, and apparently he lived around here. Scott Keith. And Cheryl, it's by the 1517 Project, a Lutheran book. So, evangelical Lutherans, I love these guys. Krista. There is a copy of Grudem's smaller book that's a distillation of this gigantic book. And I believe it's on the free rack. So if anyone wants to grab it, it is a free book on the free rack. Burkoff? I like Burkoff. So Rick uh, Bauckham, you guys remember Rick for, from last year? Uh, I was talking with one of his daughters recently while we were helping him move, and she was like, yeah, my dad made us read through Burkoff's systematic theology when we were in middle school, and we had to do reports on it and things like that. I was so thankful for that was her comment. So Burkhoff's good. Okay, any questions on books? Oh, it looks like that one just got snapped up. You guys should have pounced on it. There's Christian Beliefs, a small little distillation of this gigantic 1,500-page book. Uh, and again, I don't agree with several things that he says in there, but they're all secondary issues, and they're mostly around spiritual gifts and charismatic gifts. So... Uh, not huge issues at all. Okay. We good? Uh, so we start at the beginning. What is man? Happily, the Bible itself uh, begins with the account of the creation of the world and mankind within that world. Though, as we will see, there are many other passages as well scattered throughout the pages of Scripture. Uh, by the way, note, and you'll see the footnote on the bottom, Within this section, the term man usually will have the meaning of mankind. So when I say man, I'm referring to you ladies as well. That's just invention. I'm sorry. Maybe we'll talk with someone about who created the English language. But it's representative of both men and women. 
Uh, there's biblical precedent for this terminology, which will be discussed in the unit on manhood and womanhood. So hopefully I fulfill that promise, because <laughs> I haven't finished the section on biblical manhood and womanhood. Uh, though we will see, there are many other passages as well, scared. So our first account that we want to look at is Genesis 1, verses 30, 26 through 31. Now, a context on Genesis 1, it describes the creation of the universe and man. Following the creation of light, atmosphere, seas, land, and animals, God created the first man. Then he created the first woman from the side of the man. This first creation account introduces man as the pinnacle of God's creation, the culmination of everything that has come before. There are two major sections of this passage. So first we want to see the creation model. Uh, verses 26 through 27, Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Note as we read through that, there are hints of the Trinity scattered throughout this passage. Let us make man in our image. Not let me make man in my image, but let us. Man is in some way a reflection of the triune nature of God himself. In the Hebrew, there is what's called a wow consecutive, which indicates that there is a significant shift in the narrative. And in Genesis, there's a wow consecutive. Then God said, uh, uh, it's just a Hebrew letter and just you don't have to worry about it, but just the fact that it's there means we're now shifting into a, a new portion of the narrative. We can infer from this that the creation of Adam is now what the previous cre creation had all been intended for. Without the creation of man, the world would have been utterly incomplete. Moreover, the creation before was, crea before was created at least in part for the benefit of Adam and his offspring. The image of God is such an important concept that we'll spend an entire section on it next week, Lord willing, but here it's sufficient to say that the image of God is a representation of God. An image is a picture, so we are a picture of who God is, or an image, an icon of God. When God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, God plans to make a creature similar to himself. Both the Hebrew word for image, thelem, and the Hebrew word for likeness, demut, refer to something that is similar but not identical to the thing it represents or is an image of. The word image can also be used for something that represents something else. This is vital to our understanding of the first Adam and second Adam, Christ, as our representative head. This is going to be majorly important when we get into the doctrine of salvation. The first Adam versus the second Adam. And all of the Bible can be the story of the first Adam's failures and the second Adam's conquest. Every portion of Scripture can either be about the first Adam or the second Adam. And when I say every portion of Scripture, I'm actually using a very complex theological terminology by saying that every part of Scripture can be about the first Adam or the second Adam. Without exception, everything can reflect the first Adam or the second Adam. And sometimes it reflects both in contrast. Verse 27 is vital as well in our understanding of what it means to be human. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is a classic Hebrew poetic form where each line is a conceptual rhyme. So in English, we rhyme sounds. Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. In Hebrew, they, they rhymed thought. They didn't rhyme sounds. And so each one of these lines is kind of a rhyme or a, or a development of this idea. We see a progressive parallelism where God created mankind in his image. It is in the very image of God that he created Adam. And both male and female, he created in his image. We will have a whole section on the concept of biblical masculinity and femininity, but it must be said here that women are indeed bearers of the image of God. Ladies, you have the same value and worth as men. This is not true in many religions where people, where women are the subservient creature, they are less than male. In Christianity, women are equal with men. Now we will put an asterisk next to that and say that they have different roles, but in substance, in value, 
you are just as valuable as me. You are just as valuable as any other person created in the image of God. And this is one of the reasons why the Taliban have raged through the cities in Afghanistan and pulled women out of their houses and forced them to marry other Taliban soldiers because they are less than, they are property, they are not on the same level as the male. But in Christianity, there's nothing like that. True biblical Christianity. When we look at what the Bible actually says, now, of course, men have abused the traditions of the church. Men have used certain passages to control women and treat them as second-class citizens. But from the very beginning, God created them male and female. In the image of God, he created them. So we'll have a whole section on that later on, uh, two weeks from now, I believe, or maybe three. Uh, as such, women bear the same dignity, value, and worth of a man. Both are as valuable as the very image of God. Next, we've got the cultural mandate. So we first had the creation, now we've got the cultural mandate. The second part of this passage contains what theologians have come to call the cultural mandate. This is the summary commandment of what God required of his representatives on earth. So he creates them and then he commissions them with a mandate in which they are to follow. He, he forms them out of the dust of the earth for Adam, and then he forms Eve out of the rib taken, or the part of his flesh taken from his side, and he then gives them a job to do. In verses 28 through 31, And God blessed them, and he said to them, Note this, all of this is the blessing of God. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the field and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. There's three components to this cultural mandate. And it must be noted that this mandate is the very blessing of God upon the man and the woman. The first command is that they should be fruitful and multiply. That is, they were to have many children. In the original creation, there was no room for people who didn't want to have kids. The result of obedience to this first command would have been that the earth is filled with ambassadors bearing the image of God. So God wants his people to reproduce and fill the earth with his image, representing him to all of the creatures that he created. Every corner of the world was designed at this time to allow for the thriving of mankind. Note that the climate was probably radically different than it is today, so, there would, there was more, so this was more than possible. It was designed by God. Inferring from the text. I think the flood. I think the flood was a major change. Also the very curse of God in Genesis 3. And all of a sudden now the ground is producing thorns and thistles when it didn't before. All of a sudden plants are growing thorns. Roses used to not have thorns if we take Genesis 3 in a certain way, which I think is legitimate. Uh, and... Because of Adam's sin and because of the flood, which is the result of the descendants of Adam's sin, uh, the world was radically changed. But you're jumping ahead to the doctrine of sin. You've got like four months for that to come up. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the final command of this mandate was that the image bearers would subdue and have dominion over the earth. Now, these two words have been greatly abused in the church to mean rape and tread on the earth which uniquely enough could be an alternate translation of this verse. I didn't quite realize that until I dug into it. Uh, you could translate subdue and have dominion over the earth as rape and tread on the earth. Uh, it does a little. But that's to say that the Hebrew words are translated in other places with the connotation of subduing in a sexual way and treading on or beating down something respectively. However, given the nature of our God, it's right to claim that he commanded his rep he did not command his representatives to rape and pillage the earth. He would not do this. 
he would not look at his good creation and then say it needs to be a little bit better by some scorched earth policy. No, that's not what God is calling the people to do. However, given the nature of God, our God, it's right to claim that he commanded his represent did not claim, did I actually, there may be a typo in there. It is not right. It is not right. Yes. Not right. Aren't you glad that this is not scripture? Our Bibles are perfect, but these booklets are not Oh, okay. <gasps> I'll make sure my editor actually looks through the notes for the next time. She's over there nodding her head. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. It does? Okay. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> okay. Kenneth Matthews writes, uh, the following in his excellent commentary on Genesis 1 through 11 so this is quoting from Kenneth Matthew, so I'm not responsible for this, but I'm quoting with approval, so hopefully it works out well. This appointment by God gave the human family privilege, but also responsibility as caretakers. The Hebrew love for life and the sacredness of all life assumed a linkage between human righteousness and the welfare of the earth. In the agrarian economy of ancient Israel, this was best expressed in the care for its livestock. By the way, the Bible is very clear that a righteous man, which we're about to read from Proverbs 12.10, a righteous man cares for the needs of his animal. Implication, a wicked man cares not for the needs of his animal. Sin impacts the prosperity of the earth and its inhabitants. Genesis shows how human sin elicits God's curse upon the land, and the latter wickedness of human society results in the destruction of the whole earth by a flood. Specifically, these three zoological groups that have been placed under human care. Human life then bears the responsibility under God and is held accountable for the world God has created for humanity to govern, for the earth he has given to mankind. In no way did Moses or God intend for man to ravish the earth and hoard as much as he could, consequences be damned. All this is to say that there is a real and biblical precedent for creation care and I would argue more importantly, creature care. Similar, simply put, do we reflect or distort God's character with how we treat animals in the environment? So that's where I get a little hippie on you guys. That, and you can take it or leave it. This is a third level doctrine. If you don't believe in creation care, we can, we can still break bread over my organic grass-fed meat at home uh, that's humanely raised and butchered. Actually, we don't have that, but we should get some of that. But we can still have fellowship if you disagree, and that's okay. Ben. No. Go ahead. Mm hmm. Uh huh. I believe so. I believe so, yes. Now, there's a few options in that that I, I don't know which one it is. You can take my father-in-law's view. I love you, but my wife is shaking her head. She doesn't agree with this view either. So you can take it or leave it. That There's mixed reviews that there were trees in the garden that had stakes growing on them. Or meat. My father-in-law's. Oh, he believes that's in heaven. So, well, new creation, uh, new, the new heavens and the new earth reflect the old heavens and the old earth. No death. Right. The other option, I believe that the plants were probably more nutritious and were able to be digested easier. That's just a, a guess at trying to rectify these two kind of divergent things that I'm seeing. And I see all of these as possible because what happens in Genesis 3, even though we're jumping ahead, God curses the earth. And it's totally different. Perfect food manna from heaven? Yeah? 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Unless the grass was way more nutritious. And, but here's the other thing. I, I also believe that God created the world knowing full well, because he's God, that human beings would sin and that he would curse it all. And one day ant, lions would tear each other apart or tear other animals apart. And that's why he also built us with immune systems. That's why he created us with the ability to adapt to different environments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Sufficient and new, complete proteins, we could say. Yeah. Yes. Everything changed after the fall and after the flood, too. Good question. I don't know. It says that there are four rivers flowing through it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 It definitely was not the whole world. It was a, even a region or maybe even just a valley. I'm not exactly sure. There are several rivers flowing in it. Uh, that, so it's big enough to house four rivers. But definitely, they were booted out. Uh, and one of the things that they were supposed to do in, in uh, subduing and, and filling the earth was that they were supposed to expand that garden to fill the entire world. And that's one of the beautiful things. God created us to work. He created us to do things. So often, people have this horrible view of heaven where it's just sitting on a cloud, strumming a harp, doing nothing. There's even a joke where one guy goes to a certain place and he tries whatever he wants to and he wins at it all and his hobbies come together just perfectly and he's like, okay, what's next? And he talks with the angel in the joke and the person says, well, you're actually in hell because everything comes so easy. The, heaven is going to be perfect and it's going to have work in it. And that's part of the reason why it's perfect is because we are working again. But God created Adam to tend this garden Anyone who gardens knows it's work. And granted, we have thorns and thistles that come along with it, but the fact is that Adam was given a task to expand this garden into the entire world as the image bearer and with his helper alongside of him. Yeah. No, I think it was all, there's a, there's a continuity, because especially if we look at the new heavens and the new earth as a recreation, a return to Eden as a new, he, new earth, there's going to be correspondence between the first Adam and the second Adam. Potentially, unless it was just washed away in the flood. But then a second Eden. Ben. I believe so. And yet it is also okay for us, post-Genesis 3, post-flood, to eat animals. Perfectly fine. In fact, that's what God told Adam or Noah to go do. Uh-oh. Let's move on because our time is short. Yes, because you're a new person, you are allowed a question, not these guys over here. Edge of protection? Okay. I took 
two years of Hebrew, and the moment I learned Greek, those two years were except for Selim, Ish, Ish is man, Isha is woman, because woman was taken out of man. Uh, that's about all that I know of Hebrew. So I can maybe, possibly, probably not remember, but I will try to remember along the way and find an answer. Actually, Derek, you find the answer. No, I'm just kidding. Genesis chapter 2 is creation take 2. The second chapter of Genesis is a retelling of chapter 1, but with a different emphasis. Where chapter 1 was the creation as a whole, in the second chapter, Moses focuses upon the creation of man specifically. Verse 7, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Note the uniqueness of how Adam was created. For all the other animals, all the other creatures, God spoke and boom, they came into being. The molecules that formed their being obeyed that voice and assembled themselves together into functioning turtles, manatees, and egrets. For Adam, however, it was a different story entirely. God himself takes dust from the ground and shapes the torso. He shapes the two legs and the head of his image bearer. He then breathes into Adam the very breath of life. This is a special and intimate creation account fit for a son of God. Verses 15 through 17, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And I think that's Yahweh God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Notice that God gave Adam work to accomplish. There was no sitting around on a cloud strumming a harp. I think I already said this. He gave Adam a job that he was perfectly suited to do. This garden was planted by the greatest gardener the world has ever known to be the pinnacle of beauty. God here gives Adam one command. Eat from every single tree that I planted in this beautiful place except that one. How we read too much into the word. We focus on the don't and neglect the do, even though in this case the do is far more expansive than the don't. Did you notice that? Go, Adam, take, eat of every tree of this garden. Except for that one. But what we do? He said, no. I must. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The reason why we have immune systems, even though we didn't get sick, Adam didn't get sick before the fall, is because God is perfect in his knowledge and wisdom and created us prepared for the fall. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. There's probably more that God told and instructed Adam in the garden, if indeed there's a covenant of works here, and we'll talk about that in the doctrine of salvation. Uh, a covenant framework. I am a covenantalist. I have come to this conclusion a few months ago. That is a third level issue. We'll put it at third level, right, Derek? Covenantalism. Yeah, we can do it. We can go there. Uh, Derek and I are covenantalists, and hopefully the rest of you will be too by the end of our time together. Uh, you don't have to be. But I believe that there was a covenant that God made with Adam. Do this and live. Do this and die. Or don't do this and die. And the summation of the covenant of work. And here's the beauty of why that is important. The first Adam was told, do this and live, and if you do this one thing, you will die. The second Adam did all those things and lived, and yet he was put to death for the first Adam who didn't do it and died. So the covenant of works that I've come to really love and appreciate because it shows us the grace of God. Yes. And I promise I will support that and prove it to you in the coming months. If that's brand new to you, we can also talk. Uh, also, another thing, next week, if any of you are interested, my wife and I are happy to open up our house for a few hours between theology and the Sunday service. So if you want a place to hang out, talk. Uh, we have two daughters that are a blast. Uh, you can 
interact with them. You can have fun at our house and uh, not have to drive far distances if you drive far distances. Come talk with me afterwards or maybe we'll uh, just make a handout. I forgot to do that. Genesis 2, 18 through 20, Then Yahweh God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. This is the first time that something is not good in our creation account. God had seen everything else that he had made and declared it to be good. But now there is something lacking. Any husband will readily admit just how not good this creation was. In this passage, God does something interesting. He shows Adam his utter need and loneliness by parading every other creature that has been made so that Adam could both name them and see his solitary state. It is incredible to consider that within the 24-hour period of the sixth day, Adam was able to see each kind of animal and give it a name. By the way, this implies that Adam's brain was way smarter than ours prior to the fall. The effects of the fall affected our mind, and that's called the noetic effects of sin. We'll get to that, don't worry, and there won't be a quiz later on. Uh, But Adam was smarter. And Adam could look at a lion, the animal du jour, and he could see the long teeth. He could see the claws, and he could look at its structure and its physique, and he could call it lion, or whatever the equivalent thereof was in his time. And in this time period, I think that it wasn't a tabby cat, a black cat, a mountain lion, a tiger, a lion, but I think that in this moment in time, there was just a kind of cat and then they adapted and expand through microevolution. I know, bad word, but micro means that it's okay. Macro, big evolution, I don't believe in, but small adaptations are clearly a part of God's creation that he baked in. And so Adam was able to look at whatever that first lion looked like and name it a lion. But along the way, he saw male lion, female lion, male wolf, female wolf. Male monkey, female monkey. And there was no one found fit for him. Adam was able to see each kind of animal and give it a name. In the Hebrew culture, often children wouldn't be given a name until their character and temperament was discerned. Only then would a name be given accordingly. In this way, Adam contemplated the nature of a lion, saw its teeth, its furry mane on the male and the sleek neck of the female, and then he named it a lion or the equivalent of whatever language Adam spoke. The last words of this passage are somewhat haunting, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. Goose and gander, duck and drake, swan and cygnet, doe and buck, sow and bear, each had a companion, but not so for the first man. Side note, isn't this the way that God still works? He shows us our need, and then he graciously meets that need. A helper fit for him has the idea of one who is perfectly fitted to him to help him accomplish the mission that God had given him. Without this helper, Adam would fail. Without this helper, Adam is not able to do what he and God desires to do. Make no mistake, this helper is not optional, but absolutely and vitally necessary for Adam's work in the garden. Finally, well, we've got a few more passages. So that Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Yahweh God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man, Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, for she was taken out of Ish. The first surgery with the best anesthesia performed by the perfect surgeon. Note well from where the bone was taken, his rib, not his foot that he may walk on her, not from his head that she may lord over him, uh, but from his side, close to his heart and under his strong arm of protection, a perfectly suited helper. You can hear the relief and exuberant joy in Adam when he waxes poetic, When he sees his wife, he finally has his compliment. He had his companion and she had her, she had hers. The final name that he gave that day was to his own wife. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This last pair of verses in this passage are God's ordination of the institution of marriage. A godly marriage requires that the man and the woman leave their parents' house, influence, and reliance, and transfer everything that they have to their new family. 
So much trouble has resulted from the failure to leave a parent's influence. But that's for another time. There's other scattered passages throughout Scripture. Actually, they're not even scattered. They're everywhere throughout the pages of Scripture. Genesis 3.20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Genesis 5, 1 through 2, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and he named them man when they were created. Job 33, 6, behold, I am toward God as you are. I too was pinched off from a piece of clay. Isn't that interesting? The book of Job. I too am just like you. I'm a pinched off piece of clay. Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth because of the ambassador that you created in the image of God. Acts 17, Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place. And finally, Colossians 1.16, For by him, that's Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So that is the origin of man. Any questions? We actually have five minutes. I didn't think that was actually going to happen. Don't get used to this. But it'll be a goal. One of the biggest things with the first Adam... And I've said it before, but it's important and worthwhile saying again. The first Adam was created so that we would have a second Adam, a first Adam to compare the second Adam to. And who is the second Adam? Jesus himself. Paul in Romans chapter 5 makes a big deal out of this. The first Adam failed miserably, but the second Adam triumphs victoriously. The first Adam was given a garden in which he failed when he was tempted. The second Adam was tempted in a garden and he arose triumphantly and went to the cross. The first Adam was given a simple command, eat of every tree, except for that one. The second Adam was given a commandment of every single thing pleasing to God. And the first Adam failed and the second Adam actively obeyed everything and pleased God in all things. The first Adam led us into rebellion and all human beings are descended from that sinful Adam. I know we're getting into future sections, but that's okay. The second Adam changes our genealogy. He adopts us out of the line of Adam. He purchases us out of the bondage of Adam's line and places him, us in his own line. And so we are now no longer sons of Adam. We are sons of Christ. We are sons of the Father in heaven because we are adopted into him. And Jesus, now the second Adam, is our brother, who we get to be like. Ben, did you have a question? Every kind. No, put, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that is the same word, and I think that it, it's referring to not, uh, what are the, yeah, huh? family, I don't know, I should have our girls out here because they actually memorized all the list of the classifications, but I think kind is probably the second step from the bottom, uh, if you've got species on the bottom. Yeah, then it's the next step up. That's what I would guess is kind, but you could probably go to Answers in Genesis for a more full answer. Or Acts and Facts magazine. Uh, those are great resources if you're curious about it. But the fact remains that there weren't necessarily Florida panthers and Rocky Mountain mountain lions, and there weren't uh, uh, African lions, Asian lions, and they were just a lion. 
and they all developed into those as they moved into different corners of this altered world and adapted to their conditions. Mutation, adaptation, microevolution. Or that Noah could fit all the animals on the ark. Yeah. And yet, if you look at it as a kind, where all of a sudden those hundreds of different species become just one, then plus Noah brought babies. He didn't bring a full grown elephant onto the ark, he brought an immature young elephant. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ooh, great question. Um, next week, we're out of time. Plus, if you look at the next page, it's titled, The Image of God. Ultimately, I don't know what Adam looked like, but let's just put it this way. Darker skinned people have far less incidences of skin cancer. So uh, my daughters are better equipped than I am uh, for life under the sun, literally. Uh, so I would guess he was probably darker complexioned, but I don't know. We'll find out when we actually meet him, because yes, I do believe that the first Adam was saved, because how could we have heaven with the second Adam without the first, heaven, first Adam there too? Blonde hair, blue eyes, no, no. Yep. You're making me go over, but it's about Jesus, so that's okay. I do. And, and even more so, Jesus forgives you. Of all your sins, not just this, not, I wasn't talking about right now, of all your sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have a first Adam, our great, great, great grandfather who, who failed utterly and miserably and cast us into the misery of mankind, into our sinful state. But we thank you even more so that we have the second Adam, that we have Jesus himself, our big brother, who accomplished our redemption and your spirit who applies that redemption to us. We thank you, Lord, that you are kind and that you set your affections upon us because of who you are. We love you, Lord, and we pray that we would dwell on these things and delight in these things and know you more and grow in maturity. In your precious, wonderful name we pray. Amen.